Terry's going to lead on this one. This is about um, basically twenty billion dollars worth of slip. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah, two two major things. First of all, the Artemis uh, project to uh, get people back on the moon again. There are a number of reasons for that. Uh, there was a funding shortfall. There was, of course, the COVID crisis. Uh, the one that is perhaps of most interest to us is that Blue Origin were suing NASA for not uh, allowing them to also enter into the, the contest to get a spacecraft onto the moon. Um, they eventually dropped that and things are now going ahead. But it means that officially now NASA have said that they plan 2024 landing for uh, humans on the moon again, at least by them. I don't know whether anybody else is going to beat them to it. I don't think so. That's postponed to no earlier than 2025. And I think that's reasonable. Again, safety is paramount in uh, anything to do with space and uh, to try and rush it. I know they, they managed to eventually get um, people on the moon on the Apollo program within Kennedy's timetable, but they had a few mishaps along the way. We don't want any more of those. So now um, I would say probably with COVID still being very much a, an issue and uh, all the other uh, things in terms of funding being available, 2025 is probably optimistic in terms of the first half of the year. It might be the second half of the year. And again, if you, if you want to have a, a rough idea of what it's like to be on the moon and eventually end up with a, a base there, the Artemis book by Andy Weir is it's pure fiction, but it's the science in it is pretty realistic. So uh, have a read at that and uh, see what you think of it. Um, now, the next things then that are uh, going to be happening is that NASA will test the space launch system to send an uncrewed Orion capsule around the moon and back, possibly in February. That'll be called Artemis 1. So that'll be a, a demonstrator of the technology. Then uh, Artemis 2, which will be a crewed mission, but that will just loop around the moon. And currently that's planned for May 2024. And then Artemis 3, which will be the actual landing. And as we've just said, that's no earlier than 2025. And that would all depend on those uh, first two Artemis missions actually being successful. So, Nick, do you want to come in on that before I go on to the, the next delay thing? Yeah, yeah. The thing, the thing with Artemis. I mean, yeah, it's true. Andy Weir. I met Andy Weir in Bristol a few years ago, and he his research, as everyone knows from The Martian, is exemplary. And if you've not read Artemis, it is a very good book. It does cover a lot of kind of this return to the moon and utilizing you know sites near some of the Apollo landing sites. It's not easy, and you know the delays, as I said, due to COVID everything else blue origins lawsuits etc they've still got to go over some major major hurdles in terms of you know crew compartments the orion module itself is, is reasonably ready the service module built by the european space agency is really ready um boeing have had no end of catastrophes this is why we kind of entitled this year's debris disasters etc because boeing have had a really rough time of it um, you know, forgetting the aircraft and the 737 MAX issues, they've had a lot of issues, obviously, with the CST Starliner system. And, you know, even being able to deliver astronauts to the ISS has been a real problem for them. So between that and the cost overruns, and don't forget the cost overrun on this is in, is in the billions. It's close to $10 billion over its initial budget. And in this era of where we've got you know, a real focus on the environment to have a non-reusable rocket of this magnitude using SRB technology, which was first pioneered on the space shuttle. And again, it's, all of this is completely non-reusable. When you compare it to what we're going to be talking about a bit later, you know, we go back to our, our SpaceX thing. Um, it just seems like such a, a huge waste of money, given what is possible now with other systems. So, that's my kind of real issue there. I want to see people go back to the moon. I want to see, you know, the first female land on the moon, the first person of color land on the moon, all these wonderful things that NASA are planning. But is it not time that NASA kind of said, you know, there are other companies who are doing this and doing it technically cheaper, a lot cheaper and better. So that'd be my, my only take on Artemis. Yeah. Well, the other bit of news on uh, delay is a very minor one by comparison, and uh, I don't think it's terribly serious, but just for the record, 
uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, or now I unfortunately, with my weird sense of humor, call it the Just Wait Space Telescope, because it will go up eventually if we wait long enough. It has been postponed, but only by four days uh, from December the 18th to December the 22nd. At the moment, they're getting it ready. They're fueling up the... Um, the uh, observatory, if you count the whole thing as a space observatory, uh, the Ariane 5 is getting ready to go. So it's not a major delay, but it was just one more thing that you didn't want. Uh, <clears throat> what happened was as they were loading the whole package into the Ariane, one of the restraining bands holding, the, holding everything in place uh, either broke or separated suddenly, and that sent a shockwave through the, the whole system. Uh, as things moved. So they wanted to make absolutely sure that nothing had been uh, affected or damaged or, or put out of action uh, by that shockwave. Although when you consider the, the vibration and the, the acceleration and all the other stresses that a spacecraft is put through during the actual launch procedure itself, I think that was relatively minor. And of course, one of the things that is most crucial in getting any telescope or any scientific in instrument up into space is pre-testing it for both the, the extremely low temperatures that you have there and the vibrations that you get during a launch. So the good news is all seems well and they're on target to launch round about, I think it's 4 p.m. our time on uh, December the 22nd. So it'll be fingers crossed for that. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be like the Beagle uh, days a few, like over, about 10 years ago now, where everybody was kind of Christmas Day finger crossing, hoping that um, the little Beagle lander um, built and developed by, you know, uh, Colin Pillinger in the UK as part of the European Space Agency mission to Mars. And it did land and it landed successfully and deployed most of its solar panels successfully. Um, but this is the thing, going back to what you were saying about what they call TVAC, you know, you know test vacuum testing and TVT testing, uh, where you're basically shaking and baking a spacecraft on the ground. The whole thing with the James Webb is that it's so large, it hasn't been fully integration tested. Mm -hmm. There isn't a vacuum chamber anywhere on the planet big enough to do that. Um, on top of that, it's got to work. There are, I mean, there's hundreds of things that could go wrong. And we talked about, you know, you talked about the seven minutes of terror before, the two weeks of terror with this one as it kind of goes out there. And then it's it's several months, really, before this thing's fully operational, you know, working, delivering images, we hope, um, and not failing because, you know, anything could go wrong. We don't want it to, but, you know, you've got a European Space Agency Ariane system, which has failed on launch. It has blown up on launch. Um, who knows? 